Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to all our guests. My name is Liliana Popescu. I'm vice rector at the National University for Political Studies and Public Administration. And I'm also running a project called Eastern and Southeastern Europe Panel Network, which consists of a number of uh, experts in international relations. I'm very happy that today we are uh, together with uh, Simona Hobinku, with Dr. Simona Hobinku, who is the president of uh, Women in International uh, Security Romania, and together with Alina Inae, who is uh, our co moderator. Uh, I will just say a few words about the idea of a panel network. Uh, what we are doing is uh, organizing a number of events in which we gather women experts in international relations. And we do that just to, um, to mirror the innumerable panels, panels um, in which only men are participating. And we believe that um, it is very important that in international relations and in conflict to have women's voices heard. Uh, I will end here my introduction, thanking all our participants who are very busy at this point. Um, and um, I hope and I trust that we are going to be a, to have a very fruitful discussion. I'm going to invite Simona Hobinku, who is president of uh, Women in International Security Romania, uh, to say a few words of welcoming. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. Uh, so I'm Simona Hobinko, president of uh, Women in International Security in Romania, and uh, welcome to this final discussion entitled The Security of the Transatlantic Space Facing Putin's Aggressive Russia. For the past few weeks, we have all been witnessing Russia unleashing a horrible aggressive war against Ukraine and also threatening in so many ways the security of the transatlantic space. By now, more than a million people flee Ukraine, but the rest of the population is still, is still there, fighting Russia's army. On the other hand, many are concerned that Russia is not, go is not going to step back. Previous negotiations with, with Russia have failed, and the most severe sanctions have also failed to change Putin's uh, decision to stop his aggressive war. The conflict is dangerous, and uh, it can affect all in so many ways. We are living historical times and we are here today to discuss the security of the transatlantic space with the most, of course, of course, with the most distinguished guests. Thank you, Simona. Uh, let me present you um, my colleague, co-moderator, Alina Inae who is the director of Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation of the German Marshall Fund. Uh, and uh, I'm going to offer her the floor to start our event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists, for, for making time uh, for a discussion, which is going to be, I think, extremely interesting, as it is very, very timely. Uh, because everybody is very busy and because we have important panelists, uh, uh, people who are who are very high um, in the uh, um, in, in in the government, uh, we are going to start right away and we are not going to 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 waste any more time. Also, we will not go longer than 90 minutes uh, because, as I said, everybody's busy and this would, uh, should give us enough time both to discuss and to take questions and answers. Before I turn to the panelists, I do want to remind those who are um, participating in this webinar that you can use the Q&A section to ask questions to the panelists all and or, or, or specific panelists that you're interested in, in the answer of. Um, and with this, I would like to turn to the first panelist, Rose Gottemuller, who is a former Deputy Secretary General of NATO, and ask you, ask you the following questions. Um, given the situation, which is in extreme flux, it's very fluid. It changes on the on the in Ukraine. The military situation changes by the hour, uh, if not by uh, by the minute. Um, it's still yet difficult to predict what the military outcome of of this conflict would be. Yet, I would dare ask you, given your experience with uh, with NATO. Um, 
how do you think this conflict will eventually end? And once it will end, how, what do you think should be done to manage the situation which will, is unfolding and will unfold afterwards? What kind of peace will we be looking at? Um, and are we, by we, I, I mean EU, NATO, and the US, prepared to meet the consequences of what's going to happen in Ukraine? Rose. Oh, <clears throat> Alina, these are so many complex questions and they are on everybody's lips right now. I hope that we can have an opportunity for our discussion this morning to illuminate some of them. I am glad to see that uh, there is some continuing diplomacy going on, although I have to say I'm very concerned about the evident cynicism of the Russian Federation in its negotiation with regard to these humanitarian quarters, saying that, yes, people can leave Ukraine, but they must go to Russia or to Belarus. This is ridiculous, and it contradicts every notion of humanitarian care for citizens who are trying, you know, basically to save, in many cases, save uh, people who are ill or children and getting them to, uh, to a place where they can be safe and cared for. So I, I am worried about evident cynicism and, and lack of uh, really response, of uh, true response from Russia at the negotiating table so far. But I also take note that there seem to be a number of efforts underway now, including uh, the Turks have announced, uh, it seems, a meeting between the foreign minister of Russia and the foreign minister of Ukraine in the coming days. So perhaps once we get into more high level discussions, we can begin uh, to move in the direction of some some resolution of this of this terrible invasion. I will say uh, it's going to be up to Ukraine and the Ukrainians what position they will, of course, put forward at the negotiating table. And they will then have to, uh, again, I think with our support, with the support of the United States and the NATO allies, the European Union, and their, their neighbors, friends and neighbors, uh, and Romania has been among them, uh, they will have to do what they can uh, to find a solution that works for Ukraine. And uh, I cannot exactly see what the outlines of that solution would be at this point. I know that President Zelensky has mentioned the notion of some kind of a neutrality, neutral status for Ukraine. I do not know if that is what the Ukrainians will put on the table, but I do think that we will have to support them in their efforts uh, and be very, very clear and firm as we have been in supporting their efforts to defend themselves from invasion. Thank you, thank you, Rose. Um, I will get back to you in the second round of questions because I, well, there are, there are still some questions on the table, but let me move on to the next speaker, Luminita Odobescu, who is presidential advisor to the president of, um, of Romania. Um, Ms. Anovescu, I would pose the same questions to you, but also if you can, if you can look at, at what's going on, what do you think it's going to, to, you can't really predict, but how are we preparing ourselves for what is going to happen to come, to develop uh, once the military conflict is going to be over, to be over, but please also uh, reflect on this uh, from, from, from Romania's position, obviously. Hello uh, again. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm uh, very honored to to be with you this evening. It's uh, a timely discussions, and I uh, fully share what uh, Rose uh, uh, has just uh, uh, said. I mean, it's very difficult to predict. Now we really uh, are focusing on concrete solutions. First of all, uh, to 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 help and uh, to support Ukraine uh, in, in, with all our uh, possible means. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, I've, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's public that uh, what, uh, on what Romania has done as, uh, and it, uh, it continues to, to do with respect uh, uh, to, to our uh, monetary assist, assistance to Ukraine, but not only, uh, we have uh, just proposed to, to um, set up a humanitarian hub close to the border with Ukraine to, to helping uh, the, and to coordinate the, the humanitarian assistance uh, for Ukraine, but not only uh, uh, for, uh, for Ukraine, but also for Republic of Moldova and also for supporting the refugees uh, 
who are, who are fleeing uh, uh, Ukraine. With respect to the refugees, you have seen all the efforts of, of Romania in helping and welcoming. We'll take care on, on, uh, of uh, every refugees. Uh, and we are now working with uh, European Commission, uh, with, uh, all, with member states, with our uh, partner US uh, in order to, to, to help the refugees um, uh, which, are, um, uh, which are on our territory. Uh, so this is, uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of direct support, uh, medical assistance. We have started to treat the wounded uh, uh, militaries and uh, uh, one, uh, wounded people uh, in Romania. So it's a lot. We are in direct contact with the uh, Ukrainian authorities to help. So this is very, very important and in close coordination. I think in the, I mean, uh, if it's, it's hard to say if it's positive, something in this, um, it's difficult to say it's positive, but I think our strength in all this, it's the unity, unity, uh, 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 transatlantic unity, uh, unity at the level of the EU, uh, unity between NATO and EU, unity with US, uh, Canada, and uh, other like-minded like -minded countries, uh, Japan, and, uh, you know, this is, uh, this was essential. and. Uh, this allow us to react quickly, to take a decision um, to, uh, to, to sanction Russia. Of course, we have to continue to sanction Russia. I, I think we, we, we had already um, agreed uh, um, on uh, three packages, I would say, and we will continue. Uh, in this in this respect, and we have to isolate and to show Russia uh, the consequences of they are they are doing. As Rod, Rod, Rose said, of course, I'm a, I'm a diplomat. Of course, we have to to give uh, give uh, the the talks a chance. But we also know that uh, that Russia is not a trustworthy partner, and uh, we have seen exactly uh, their behavior. Uh, it's very difficult to, the, to predict, predict how this war would uh, would end. Uh, we hope to, be, to 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 a solution to be found as soon as possible. But, but from this point of view, we will support uh, Ukrainian. We are, we are very much uh, supporting their uh, territorial the territorial integrity. This is very important. The sovereignty. It's a sovereign country. They have to choose their their right to 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 live uh, and uh, to with respect to their territory. They they it's it's about their own destiny, and we all uh, admire uh, their resistance and uh, courage. Uh, it's it's real real a symbol and uh, for for all of us. But we have to we have to continue to support uh, to, to support Ukraine. Of course, another uh, another important I would say. Um, uh, point for us is to protect ourselves, and this is uh, uh, this is the role of of NATO, but also of the of the EU. You have seen uh, all the the discussion, all the measures take it at the level of NATO. Uh, to see in, in our case, in our situation, uh, we 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 have uh, here. Um, all the support from our ally, allies, uh, from US to uh, Italy, France, uh, um, Germ Germany. So this is very important because it's about the Eastern flank. And uh, you all know that this is defensive. It's protecting ourselves. So yes, uh, let's hope for, for finding a solution. But meanwhile, we have to continue to coordinate to take actions, uh, to move immediately, to support Ukraine, and of course to 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 hope uh, that uh, a solution will be find, found as soon as possible. Because it's it's very difficult to see. Uh, we 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 have on the Romanian tele televisions, and my president was uh, two days ago in one of these uh, camp at our border. And we, we see we see the tragedy. This is about lives of uh, this is about uh, families. It's about it's it's at our border. It's so touching, and we as uh, uh, women we know uh, how touching is uh, is uh, is uh, this for all of us. 
So this, these are my, how to say, my introductory comments. But uh, yes, we we have to 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 support Ukraine and all uh, we to 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 support all the efforts in putting uh, 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 an end uh, to this uh, to, to this war. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Ms. Agabescu, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you spoke. You spoke uh, quite uh, intensively about unity, about the unity of. The West, the transatlantic unity. I might, I, I might even. Add. This is something that uh, this is an issue that we are going to discuss. It, I hope a little bit at length um, uh, later in the in the conversation. Let me move on to the next speaker, who is also a government official. And I know that um, everybody has very limited time. That that's that's what that's why maybe we can keep the introductory remarks as as crisp as possible. Uh, Ms. Simona Kojokaru, who is um, Secretary of State within the Ministry, Ministry of National Defense, also of, of Romania. Uh, Ms. Kojokaru, Ms. Odobescu has spoke um, about diplomacy. Um, can you speak to us a little bit about the military aspects and the military unity? Um, and how long is this going to hold? Thank you very much for this question. Let me salute once again all the participants. I'm very much delighted to be here with you. Uh, one uh, remark uh, for the beginning. In my back there, uh, we have uh, Smaranda Brescu. She is uh, a famous, famous uh, parachuter in Romania, uh, born in 1897. He, uh, she uh, held the world record in the highest jump with parachutes. So we are very much honoring her memory. This year in Romania is a year dedicated to Smaranda Brescu, and I'm very proud that in this uh, in this fall in my department we are uh, honoring uh, her personality. Second, uh, with your permission, women leadership is vital. I congratulate you for this initiative. Uh, we need uh, we need uh, to have more women in international security, more debates. I was myself taking part in a couple of rounds of, of these debates in, in other uh, light uh, uh, countries. And by the way, uh, Ms. Odobescu just uh, referred to the solidarity uh, in NATO and EU. We had very important visits uh, lately here in Romania, in Mikhail Kogonikanu, German Minister of Defense, French Minister of Armed Forces, Dutch Minister of Defense, all women. So, uh, very important, and we are expecting a high level visit from US. Another very, very important uh, woman, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, is going to visit uh, Europe, uh, including Romania, very soon. We expect. So, uh, conclusion very important role for women nowadays in security and defense. Here at the Department of Defense Policy, we are dealing, of course, not only with the military issue of the with the with the military um, issues, but with the uh, defense policy, political military issues, uh, topics, if you like. And we uh, registered lately a huge, huge wave of solidarity and unity uh, amongst NATO and EU uh, countries, uh, member states. In relation with the with the with the with the war in Ukraine, what I'd like to say uh, from from our part, just to complement of what uh, the other speaker said, uh, it is totally unacceptable what is happening right now in Ukraine, and uh, it's clear that Russia proposed to change uh, by conducting this war not only the security situation, the stability, democracy, sovereignty, territorial integrity of Ukraine, but also the European security architecture and to establish spheres of influence. Uh, we have stressed many, many times, but this is totally, totally, um, you know, out, outrageous. And it is not any more about us being concerned, about us being worried, it's about a grave, disparate situation in, in Ukraine. Uh, I have mentioned uh, Mikhail Kogonichan. This airbase uh, became the focal point 
of the Allied efforts on the eastern flank. Uh, we have many, many troops for the first time in history. NATO activated um, NATO response force, elements of NATO response force. We have uh, here troops uh, from uh, France. Uh, Belgians are just, uh, they just entered the Romania. Uh, we have air policing with Italy, Germany, US is very much present with a striker battalion and also at the air level with, uh, with uh, aircraft uh, and uh, air capabilities. So my, my answer to your question is that solidarity is massive these days, uh, but, uh, you know, if I may to refer to your previous question, uh, we uh, asked ourselves uh, on 21 uh, of February when Putin signed the decrees uh, to recognize the independence of Donetsk and Luhansk, what would uh, come next and what was the worst case scenario? Mm -hmm. So we are, uh, you know, it's, it's practically impossible to uh, predict right now how the end will look like. It's totally unpredictable uh, and we are very much, uh, we are extremely troubled about what is happening in Ukraine, also with the civilian casualties. And I cannot but to support what Ms. Rodobescu said about Romania's efforts at the level of uh, authorities, national authorities, the president, the government, uh, all the, the ministries, uh, but also the civil society. Very, very, uh, yeah, extraordinary mobilization. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rest. Thank you, Ms. Kojo Karu. Let me let me turn now to, to our two guest speakers from um from across the ocean, actually. Um, and I will start with uh, with Ms. Um, uh, professor Cynthia Enlow, uh, who is a professor at the Clark University. Um, and also try, I, I mean, I will pose the same question to you. Not only how do you see the end of the conflict, you know, look like, although if you have a crystal ball, please use it, but uh, how prepared are we as a transatlantic society, as a transatlantic universe, if you want, to, to, to deal uh, with what is going to, what is going to come after the conflict is over with a peace, peace, instability, whatever is going to come once the conflict is over. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to this lively and very smart conversation. More of us here in the US should be listening to Romanian um, women experts to understand what the complicated reality is. So I feel very privileged being able to listen to all of, of you. And I'm especially grateful to Liliana for having created FANEL. Um, a network of uh, South and Southern Europe and Southeastern Europe um, women who are experts on national security broadly imagined. So the first thing is to say, if we didn't have Liliana and Fanel, we might not even be having this conversation. And that reminds me that we need to have networks uh, of women. And I would say, especially of women who have had training in gender analysis analysis, you can't make sense of any war, whether it be a war in Ethiopia or a war in South Sudan or a war in um, Ukraine, uh, you can't make sense of any war unless we all have access to people who are trained in uh, analyzing both masculinities politics and femininities politics as wielded by governments um, to wage those wars and to justify those wars. So I'm particularly glad that women's studies and gender studies has been defended in Romania. Um, I know that there was some question about that and the constitutional court in Romania came down saying, no, no, uh, you cannot ban women and gender studies. They're too important to society and they're not important to society just when you have peace. Gender and women's studies expertise uh, is important right now in the middle of alarm, in the middle of crisis. So I guess my first kind of caveat, my first warning uh, to myself as well, um, is that when you have 
uh, a full-fledged hot war is not the time to imagine that you no longer have to listen to gender experts, to gender analysis. That is, there's a temptation to say, oh, not now, later, that's an extra, that's, you know, luxury, that's icing on the cake, you can do that during peacetime, have gender analysis. No, no, right in the middle of a crisis, whether it be a natural disaster or a war, right in the middle of a crisis is when you have to have gender experts uh, speaking out, making sense of actually how things are happening. I'm afraid I don't have a crystal ball, um, as you guessed, maybe I wouldn't. Um, so I'm trying now, I mean, it depends on what kind of peace you have. You can have a highly militarized, oppressive thing called, that other people will call peace. I would put it always in quotes. Peace is only with justice. Peace is never an oppressive peace. That's an oxymoron. So it really depends how this continues to unfold. Um, and uh, I would focus on what's happening now because that will determine what kind of end of overt violence happens, whether it is a fake peace, that is a peace with oppression um, and with militarization, or a peace that is genuine in which all women and men of various uh, ethnicities and classes and ages um, are able to live their secure lives. That's my first warning, I guess. My second is that um, you, you have to really keep your eyes and ears open to uh, feminist analysis during war. There's a temptation to, well, a temptation by non-feminists or people who just aren't familiar with feminism to imagine that feminists are pie in the sky, unrealistic, always called naive by patriarchal people. Um, as if they don't really know how to talk about hard realities. If I've learned one thing over the years, and I've been taught it by feminists in many countries, including Romania, uh, but also feminists in Ukraine and feminists in Russia and feminists in Sweden. If I've been taught one thing, it's that feminists are the most realistic because they look at every one of those women with their dependent children. And I never say women and children. I say women and dependent children, because that shows the hard work in wartime of being a parent. Women and their dependent children on the train stations trying to cross the borders with their dependent children. And I realize that they are actors. They are not just fleeing. They are not just vulnerable. They are responsible civil society actors. And we should never just treat them, and you wouldn't, I know you wouldn't, but you should none of us should ever just treat them as women and children fleeing war. That completely underestimates the amount of thinking, the amount of energy, and the amount of insight that those women with their dependent children are exerting in order to survive uh, this conflict in order to create a new Ukrainian peace. Um, and the second thing is we should never imagine that the Putin regime, and I use regime for any government that's become autocratic, um, that the Putin, we should never imagine that the Putin regime has full control over the diverse masculinities in Russia now. And I would say, look especially at the conscript uh, male soldiers in the Russian military. The Russian military is now about 10% women, but they are not... Um, deployed in combat. They're mainly deployed in uh, logistics and in healthcare. Uh, the conscripts are all male. They're about 30% of the Russian military now is conscripts. 70% are contract, quote, volunteers. And that's been particularly because of the failures of the Russian military in both the Chechen wars uh, and in Afghanistan. And after those failures, there was a disillusionment by many Russian civilians with the military as a, a state institution, and they couldn't, in fact, uh, enforce conscription as thoroughly as they used to, and that's why they began to build up a contract army rather than a totally conscript army. Um, and we shouldn't imagine that all those soldiers, uh, those male soldiers, we shouldn't imagine that they 
are all militarized so thoroughly that they are not disillusioned or that their morale won't disappear when they realize that they are not liberators, that they are oppressors. Um, so I would say two things. Keep your gender lens on. Make sure your gender curiosity is in good working order. Uh, if you're not a gender specialist, ask what gender politics are going on in this war. Um, and secondly, um, do not imagine that war waging by an aggressor is easy. And it's not easy because, in fact, masculinities and femininities, including a lot of women on the streets protesting war in Russia right now, um, masculinities and femininities are diverse, even in a war aggressive country. Um, and Putin is not in full control of them. I'm not sanguine about that, but I don't want to imagine the Putin regime is more powerful than it is. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Enlo. Um, before we lose uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Gertemoller, uh, who I understand has to leave first out of the three, the three officials, if I understand correctly, I do. And, and I know I owe, I owe uh, Karen Johnston um, uh, the word, but just just bear with me for a second before before we lose Rose. Um, because we have two questions for you, um, Rose. How plausible is the nuclear threat in your view and what does it mean for the future of arms control agreements? Two very complicated questions, I have to say. And the second one, what does this conflict teach us in regard to our future interaction with China? Any lesson um, that we can draw already? Well, thank you, Alina, and uh, I do want to stay on and hear what Karen has to say. I apologize to everyone, uh, but I will have to leave you at 9 o'clock my time for uh, another meeting. Uh, it's early morning here in, in California, um, and I regret, but I will stay on and hear what Karen has to say. Um, it has been a really, to me, uh, quite extraordinary the way Vladimir Putin has been rattling the nuclear saber, but he's been doing so over the last few years. He's been doing so egregiously in this uh, conflict, in this invasion of Ukraine, but uh, he likes to brag that back in 2014, when uh, Russia invaded Crimea, he also raised the alert level for the strategic nuclear forces of the Russian Federation. I think I'd like to unpack what has happened a little bit. Uh, I, first of all, think it's uh, necessary for us to continue to, um, to condemn egregious nuclear saber rattling because it's, uh, you know, Russia joined just in January, joined the four other nuclear weapon states in the nonproliferation treaty regime to put out a declaration that nuclear weapons, nuclear war cannot be won. And so nuclear war should never be fought. This was a state, statement first made by Reagan and Gorbachev back in the mid-1980s and now has been reiterated by the five nuclear weapon states under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And Vladimir Putin needs to remember those words. So first of all, we need to continue to remind Russia of the fact that they have just signed up to this statement that nuclear war cannot be won and should never be fought. Because the danger is supreme, not only to the country in which even a single nuclear weapon is used, but also the global effects uh, are considerable. Even a single nuclear weapon would have environmental effects, number one. But number two, it would break the tab taboo against using nuclear weapons in wartime that has been in place since the first nuclear weapons were used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki over 75 years ago now in Japan. So Russia would be taking a step that really would be uh, disastrous for all mankind. And Putin seems to be wanting to, you know, bolster his historical uh, legacy in some way by this action, bringing together Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia into the Slavic heartland as, as he seems to feel he's doing. I would not think that if he has in mind that legacy and thinks of it as a positive one, that he would want to also be universally condemned as the first leader to use a nuclear weapon in a conflict since World War II. 
So, but he's very unpredictable. We've all been saying how unpredictable Vladimir Putin is. So I think we have to take this nuclear saber rattling seriously. Two additional points here. One is that, uh, as I understand in technical terms, the nuclear uh, missiles of Russia are not on any higher alert. They are already on high alert because the United States and Russia both maintain our intercontinental ballistic missiles, sea launched and ground launched on a very high level of alert so that it is possible if one country launches a first strike that the other country can launch on warning of attack, launch under attack. And in that case, uh, the country that first launched the attack would be committing suicide. So that has been a fragile stability, that first strike deterrence, as it's called. It's been a fragile stability now for decades, and uh, I hope and believe it will be maintained. But actually, Russian missiles are not any on any higher level of alert, of alert. Actually, what has happened is more personnel have been put into the nuclear command posts, which is a procedure that the Russian Federation and Soviet Union before it carries out when uh, they are watching U.S. nuclear training exercises. So when the U.S. exercises its nuclear forces, they put more people in their command posts to watch the exercises. So that is what has happened. They've upped the manning levels, but they have not put the missiles themselves on any kind of higher alert. So those two points. Now, what can we do next? Um, I do believe that it is important to keep nuclear weapons under control, to keep them limited. The New START treaty remains in force. As far as I hear from Washington at the present time, the Russian Federation is continuing to undertake routine implementation steps, such as sending in notifications of the status of Russian nuclear forces. So that is important that the treaty remain in force. Eventually, uh, we will have to consider how to replace it. Uh, and how we get back to the negotiating table with Russia is going to be a key question. But I think it's not a question for this moment. Uh, I think Washington was right to hit the pause button on strategic stability dialogue with Russia. We have to think about how and under what circumstances we can get back to the table with Russia to talk about limiting nuclear weapons. We will need to do so at some point to replace the New START Treaty because nobody wants to see nuclear weapons unlimited and nuclear arms racing going on such as we had in the 1950s and the 1960s. And we need also to get to your last question to bring China to the table because they are modernizing their nuclear weapons as well. And we don't want them to be building up to the levels that the Russian Federation and the United States have at the present time. That is 700 delivery vehicles deployed and 1,550 deployed warheads under the New START Treaty. So we don't want China to race to join the United States and Russia at those numbers. And so we have to think about how to get them to the table as well. How this all relates to China and the pivot to Asia that the United States has undertaken, I think it's a very, very interesting question. And I am wondering at this point if China won't see this crisis with Russia as perhaps a way to show its bona fides to the international community. I was very interested last week when Foreign Minister Kuleba of Ukraine asked his counterpart in Beijing whether China could become involved in somehow trying to facilitate diplomacy between Moscow and Ukraine and Kyiv. We will see uh, if that is possible or what role China will play. Of course, they have not in any way um, posted blame on the Russian Federation for the egregious actions uh, that Russia has been taking. But nevertheless, maybe they will be able to play a role uh, in facilitating the diplomacy. And that would be an interesting sign, I think, to all of us that China is uh, standing for the rule of law, is standing for uh, the system of, of a rules-based international order, uh, because we've been very concerned, I think, all of us, uh, that China and Russia together were uh, adopting the notion of throwing out the rules-based international order that was put in place after World War II. I want to stress, though, that not only Russia but China, they are participating in that order. They are members of the UN Security Council. So do they really want to throw out <laughs> all 
those rules uh, and somehow start again with chaos. Uh, I'm wondering about that. So I will look forward to hearing others remarks about this before I have to leave uh, at uh, 9 o'clock my time, which is in another 15 minutes. But I look forward to the comments and the remarks of, uh, of others and starting with Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rose. I will take over for a little bit uh, from Alina just to uh, ask uh, Karen. Actually, I have in my sleeve uh, a more philosophical or uh, question, but I will. I will ask that one after you leave Rose, because now we are in the practicalities area. So I'm going to ask Karen and afterwards I would like uh, to ask uh, Ambassador Minita Otopescu the same question. How are the European Union, NATO and Romania prepared to meet the consequences of a full occupation of Ukraine by Russia? So Karen, you have the floor. Thank you. It's a very complicated and very long sort of question and answer here. And um, but first of all, I, I wish to thank um, uh, the opportunity to, to participate um, with such distinguished um, individuals. And thank you also to WISE Romania. Um, I very much appreciate the invitation and hope that out of this conversation comes some very, you know, moving from theory to praxis and finding some, some very practical and very um, implementable things that we can do to try to resolve and help resolve the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, but, you know, one of the very, very first things, you know, what do we need to be prepared to do? And this is something that I think that people took note with the Biden administration, that is unity and finding a sustainable, a sustainable transatlantic consensus and coordination. I think that above all is going to be critical um, the uh, what we've learned is that the Biden administration already in October began to construct a coalition and they have had um, over 200 uh, different, um, you know, uh, calls, meetings with high ranking officials, with prime ministers, with working groups. And we need to through we need to sustain that unity. And what happens in the interim? My concern is that with all of the um, export controls and the sanctions and all of the other things that both, you know, the, the United States and the Europeans, the Japanese and everyone have now imposed, that there is a lag time between some of the impact of what those sanctions and controls can be, for example, the financial controls and the situation on the ground. And I, I worry about that. But I think in the time being, what we need to do are, are very, very pragmatic and very practical, you know, um, relevant things. First of all, the humanitarian assistance. Yes, I think that uh, for the United States, uh, the United States is sending sort of humanitarian assistance and coordinating with the European Union and with many other donor organizations to try to resolve and and, and help the um, Help the situation on the borders, as we know, also because in the Ukraine, um, the men between the ages of 18 and 60 are not allowed to leave the country. All of those, for the large part, are women and dependent children, and we need their help. We need to give them assistance. And I think the, for the United States itself, I've not yet read whether or not the United States will um, accept refugees in any large sort of numbers. I know that um, last year they um, accepted about 73,000 Afghan refugees. I think for the United States, it is important that we show also the solidarity by um, by bringing in as many of these refugees for their assist to, for us to assist them as we can. Military and security assistance. I know that we've you know had a large you know we hear a lot about that. But that security assistance <clears throat> to the Ukraine in any form is critical. Um, I read today that there's in, that the U.S. is in talks with Poland to possibly you know, obtain fighter jets <clears throat> from uh, NATO countries. There's a there's a danger in that the you know Russia has already signaled that um, that would be um, a threat to them. So we'll have to see. Um, the military and security assistance over the long term, again, I think it will have to depend on what the situation on the ground is, but we have to begin um, to 
provide and continue to provide that military assistance. It's important to note that the European Union for the first time ever has um, committed 500 million euros in lethal and non-lethal aid to Ukraine and to, to support the, uh, the countries. And so I think that is a, a critical sort of signal um, about the intention and the serious, seriousness of the intention of the European Union to, to participate. And I might say as an addition, um, the, the shifting in German foreign policy on this issue is also very critical to note that it too has abandoned its um, skepticism about um, and its, its um, policy on sending lethal weapons into conflict zones. And I think that is also something that we need to mark and need to, again, integrate into a sustained military and security assistance program. You know, many, many other things that we need to do, um, you know, monitor the effects of sanctions. We need to uh, counter the disinformation. We need to develop um, sort of, um, you know, fight the, um, well, the diplomatic actions that were mentioned, uh, particularly. That is, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. Um, the United States has continued to say that um, it has um, several of these sort of principles that it will not make any decisions about Europe without Europe that um, it will continue to leave the door open for diplomacy. Um, and I think that we need to provide um, and support those, those efforts in every way possible. And um, again, um, uh, Professor Enlo mentioned civil society. I think it's critical that we try to understand how we can move to assist um, civil society organizations. Um, again, the outcome I don't know what over the longer term is going to be possible if um, you know, Russia clamps down um, and, and they're able to um, sort of deny access to nonprofit organizations and others. We'll see I mean, about that. But in the meantime, there are lots of ways um, in which we can assist. There is, even I've learned, uh, the Ukrainian Women's Fund. Um, which is the only sort of women's based organization and feminist organization in the Ukraine, it, we need to support these kind of organizations as well. And there are many, many other things we can talk about, but I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Karen. Let me go to our Romanian colleagues, uh, Luminita um, Odobescu, Ambassador Odobescu, and uh, Minister Simona Kojokaru with this question. How well, how are we prepared as Romania as a country and as NATO member and how well is NATO prepared to face a situation in which Russia occupies Ukrainian territory, the whole territory? Thank you. Well, it's uh, it's it's not an uh, not an easy question. It's a very difficult question. But maybe for one comment on the nuclear uh, aspect, I mean, we should not uh, uh, forget the the nuclear risk because uh, in Ukraine there are four uh, nuclear power plants. We have seen what happened in uh, some days ago. Uh, provoke or unprovoked, this is a serious uh, uh, issue for all of us, and I think uh, uh, this is also this was also one of the subjects of the discussions uh, with uh, with Russians. Uh, uh, I, I I mean uh, we 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 lived uh, during Chernobyl time, and we don't want. Uh, 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 this uh, this uh, situation to be repeated. Uh, so this is quite a serious, and it's all also on top of our discussions at the uh, the level of the EU. Uh, so it's it's quite serious. Then uh, you know that Russia is uh, is uh, not far. I mean, uh, Crimea it's 180 uh, miles away. Uh, we have uh, Black Sea here. Uh, they are almost. The, the idea uh, here um, for for us, I mean, uh, we we feel protected. We are part of the NATO. Uh, the eastern uh, uh, flank was uh, consolidated, and I, as I said at the beginning, the the unity and um, 
coordination uh, remains the main atout and the, the, cap the, the our capacity to take quick decision it was even a surprise for for a lot of us uh, the way because usually in the eu you know that it takes time to react and this time we took uh, 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 immediate uh, um, dec uh, decision with immediate application, quite consistent decision in strong coordination. And this was the constant position of Romania uh, in all the discussions, stay together, uh, stay coordinated because we 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 have to 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 resist uh, uh, any uh, any attempts of the, uh, the uh, division among us. And this uh, but again, I think uh, as uh, my president uh, and the Romanian authority said, we feel protected. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, we are a member of, uh, of NATO, member of the EU. Uh, we have Article 5. Uh, so uh, these are this a very serious issue. But uh, again, uh, this is a very, very difficult question. And because it's, it's about uh, the, the, uh, the fate and, uh, of our, and the destin, uh, destiny of, uh, of our neighbor. And uh, we have uh, to, to support any solution which respect the territorial integrity and uh, uh, to be with the Ukrainians at, at the table. This is very important. So uh, as diplomats, of course, we have to to give a chance to finding a diplomatic solution, but we know uh, uh, we know very well uh, Russia and how uh, we, we we negotiate with them. So very difficult period of uh, very difficult period of time. I mean, uh, you know that everybody uh, says that it's uh, it's uh, uh, the the most severe uh, or gravest uh, crisis we faced uh, since uh, in, in decennies. So it's uh, it's uh, it's a very difficult period but let's let's remain uh, united let's work for this uh, it's uh, it's very important for all of us thank you very much ambassador i really apologize for not being able to stay more but i have to run for another meeting thank you again it was thank really you uh, thank you to see you all let's you. hope for better time to to stay together thank you a happy celebration for for tomorrow yeah well to work see everybody. Thank, you. thank you so, uh, if I may, I would like to say that uh, could uh, could sound naive at this point, but we we still give a huge role to diplomacy. The the latest news coming from from Turkey uh, is saying that uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and uh, of Russia and Dmitry Kuleba of Ukraine will meet this week. Uh, in Antalya, Antalya Diplomatic Forum. Uh, this is going uh, to be organized between 11 to 13. So uh, there is another chance, there is another step, there is another occasion for uh, to lead to peace and stability. Uh, however, it's a good, uh, it's a positive news. Uh, on the other, um, uh, on the other hand, I will say that uh, it is clear. NATO will defend, as the Secretary General said many, many times now, and all the allies, NATO will defend every inch of its territory. So this is crystal clear in, uh, in any situation. We have talked about a huge, huge, massive consolidation of the terrorism defense. Article 5 is fundamental, is sacrosanct, is vital, and it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's our, uh, you know, our raison d'etre in, in the alliance. So uh, this is uh, also very, very important to be, to be pointed out. Um, I'd like to say on nuclear, uh, I was very much pleased to, to hear from such a distinguished and, ex uh, and uh, high level uh, expert like Ross Gottmuller about, about the nuclear. I could only add to things that uh, once again Russia is using nuclear rhetoric to intimidate uh, European nations. Um, in an uncertain world, NATO's nuclear forces are, are our strongest deterrent uh, and the supreme guarantee of alliance security. But as uh, Ross Gilmer said, uh, we are seeing this uh, dangerous, reckless rhetoric, but NATO does not assess there is a need now to change the alert levels 
uh, of uh, nuclear uh, forces. So this is uh, very much clear for, for the time being. Um, I would like to say, with your permission, two other things, because I'm not sure I, I, could, uh, I could be with you uh, much more. Um, initially, uh, I, I was with Alina Inaeh in, uh, in Warsaw Security Forum. Uh, somewhere last fall in, in Warsaw, beginning of October, as I remember correctly. And we took part together, if I'm not uh, wrong, in uh, different formats in, in that forum dedicated to women in the uh, security sector. I think this is a line that we could follow starting from this format for, for other formats uh, uh, of women in international security in Romania to expand our network and to organize side events on the margins of, uh, I don't know, security forums that uh, are to be organized here in Romania. Uh, I was very, very sorry because tomorrow the Ministry of National Defense planned to organize a huge event here in Bucharest dedicated to gender balance, women in security. Unfortunately, we have been forced to cancel uh, for the time being, no, to postpone to postpone, uh, but uh, we are very much, very much following the wish, issue. I'm, I'm a huge supporter. Uh, we, uh, we, um, but uh, the, the good news is that uh, we are going to organize with National Guard of Alabama, Sherry Gordon. Uh, she will be in Bucharest and we are going to organize uh, an event called Women in Security Sector and uh, it will be in person in, in, in Bucharest. And some of you, I know, um, Romanian uh, are, are on the list. Uh, the others, I will, uh, I will take care to be to be there. Uh, so very much focus from the Romanian side, from the Ministry of National Defense on gender balance, women leaders, women in security and defense sector. Thank you. Um, thank you for, uh, very much, Ms. Kojokaro. I would like to go back. Rose, can you stay two more minutes or you have to run right away? Uh, I can stay, but I will have to go uh, within a few within a few minutes. Then I will start with you because I have a question which I want to ask the three panelists, the four panelists, uh, um, and, and see what, what you have to answer to this. Um, President Zelensky made a reference to, to a sort of Ukraine's uh, neutrality, as Ross has already mentioned. A reconsideration of European security arrangements after the war seems unavoidable, no matter how the results might be, what the results might be. How the basic of such a new arrangement could look like? Well, first and foremost, I agree with what everyone has said so far about the way that the European Union and NATO, their coherence has been strengthened uh, throughout this crisis. They have responded in, I think, an incredible way uh, by supporting Ukraine in every way possible. The countries have been, even though countries uh, who have not been, as we've been saying at NATO headquarters, always helpful on particular issues, uh, or in EU headquarters have not always been helpful on particular issues, have really been stepping up uh, now in a very, very strong way uh, to support uh, the refugee crisis uh, in, uh, I'm thinking, frankly, I can say it here, Poland and Hungary, both stepping forward and helping out with the refugee crisis from Ukraine. And in some ways, you might not have expected them to, given their recent concern about, about foreign refugees on their territory. So. I'm impressed with how NATO and the EU have pulled together and have been supporting in every way they can Ukraine. So I think at the heart of the new security arrangements or refurbishment, as I like to say, of European security architecture, I think both uh, NATO and EU will be uh, a strong foundation. Uh, and that uh, also, by the way, EU and NATO have gotten together more strongly. I was very impressed last week when when uh, we saw Ursula von der Leyen <clears throat> uh, at NATO headquarters to announce the package of EU sanctions that had been agreed during the EU summit meeting. So it was, I think, a very important show of EU and NATO uh, coherence and strength. So to be frank, I think NATO and EU will and will remain uh, the foundation for European security arrangements. 
but we also then have to think about ways to ensure that uh, those countries who are not members of the EU or NATO have a way to participate and do so in a strong way. And that means strengthening and re-energizing the Organization for Sec Security and Cooperation in Europe. In other words, you're hearing me say that we have the institutions. I think we have in many ways the tools uh, to strengthen the security architecture again. Obviously, we will have to do so in a way that responds to some of the concerns Russia has raised, even though we may not feel that they are really uh, they are really uh, real concerns or should not be real concerns, but we will have to think our way through that and work with Russia. I again return to some of the reasonable proposals that Russia made before this whole invasion began, such as to strengthen again military to military contacts, uh, to look for ways to address the issues of intermediate range nuclear missiles deployed in Europe. I think we have some opportunities, I hope, to move forward in that way. I'm sorry to say my next interview is beginning. I'm going to have to go, but thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been great to be with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll keep in touch. All the best. Uh, also, from my side, it was a huge, huge pleasure to be with you. As I said uh, on the written message, uh, we have to we have to do more together. Uh, but, uh, Simona, do you have see two minutes to answer the question, though? How do you see the new the new the new security arrangement? It's a, it's a very very complicated question. Uh, as I said, uh, we are talking about a different security architecture right now, uh, right now in Europe, because the Ukraine is not, you know, it's not per se only about Ukraine. It's also about Europe. It's about the fact that. We have war in Europe. Uh, we have refugees in Europe, and uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, we have seen, uh, we have seen, we have analyzed very carefully, as Rose Gilmer said, the proposals uh, sent by the Russians uh, two months ago. I think uh, somewhere in January, if I remember correctly, and uh, also the answer with NATO. Um, offered and also U.S. on 26 of uh, January, also if I remember correctly. Uh, the fact is that some of the proposals were totally unacceptable, like the ones uh, related to the withdrawal of forces and equipments uh, out of the countries that joined NATO after 1997. Uh, it was absolutely uh, unacceptable, and also uh, the other uh, proposals, uh, you know, uh, in relation with uh, NATO enlargement uh, and uh, and other issues. But uh, probably we have followed. We had uh, a couple of uh, NATO Russia Council meetings. We thought is a very good thing to 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 uh, for uh, for uh, for the future of the relationship. Unfortunately, this uh, this stopped. Uh, moreover, we had the NATO Russia Acting Found uh, Act, Founding Act. Sorry, Founding Act. Uh, so, which is the status of this of this act right now? Because Russia actually, uh, you know, uh, by uh, the the by uh, its actions, practically, um, totally, and irremediably um, made this uh, out of question. I mean, it's a, it's a totally uh, it's totally out of question. But as I said in my in my previous intervention, uh, we think that diplomacy still has a role. The war should be stopped by negotiations, by diplomacy, so there is no other way, no other reasonable way. And we, we do expect to, to start also uh, after, after, uh, after positive results uh, at the level of diplomacy to start kind of a dialogue with, with Russia in, in the aftermath, I mean, at the NATO level, uh, starting with uh, with different uh, premises. Uh, but uh, let's wait and see. 
as as we said, it's it's totally unpredictable. Uh, Putin is becoming uh, very much frustrated, very much frustrated. That's why we are thinking that his next moves are even even more difficult to predict than than uh, than in the past. So it's uh, it's something totally totally out of our control. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As I said, happy celebration tomorrow for, uh, for to you. you for Women's International Day. I do hope to see you all in, in different formats. And please um, take into consideration what I said for, for Romanians uh, organizing uh, different events, forums to organize uh, side events, breakfasts, I don't know, uh, special sessions uh, dedicated to women in the international security. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a good day or a good evening. Thank you. Uh, let me, uh, if if you allow me to put that, uh, it's not actually a philosophical question. It, it's more a question uh, derived from uh, looking at the conflict between Russia and the West in a longer uh, perspective. Uh, and uh, so my question is, uh, what if we think of this hot war in Ukraine or against Ukraine um, as part of a wider war that uh, Putin's Russia is waging against the West? Because this appears a lot in his narratives. Um, what do you think of this as being uh, like a hypothesis that what is happening now in Ukraine, it's just a battle in a wider war against the West? Maybe, I don't know, Cynthia or Karen, I don't know. I, I know it's not an easy question, but uh, I think it's worthwhile looking at it. Because if yeah. we look at this just as, as just, a, I don't know, um, an episodical thing that, you know, we can sort it out somehow diplomatically, we may go the, the wrong path. Well, it's interesting, Liliana, to think of all the people that we've seen visually in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but also in smaller cities around Russia who have come out with signs in Russian and in English saying no war, no to war. And so it is not, I don't think, I think Putin and the security force commanders around Putin, that's a very particular group and the most nationalistic of narrow definition of nation, nationalistic um, advisors around Putin. So take that group, Putin, the civilian extreme nationalists, Russian nationalists, and the security forces commanders. Take that group. That's quite a small group. If that's the core of the regime right now, not even the moguls and the oligarchs are part of that, I think, in fact, they are conjuring up and they have been trying to sell this narrative of Russia versus the West. But if you look at all the people, thousands of people, we don't know how to count them, but thousands of people on the street in anti-war protests in Russia in the last week, they don't have a narrative of Russia versus the West. They, in fact, want to create a Russian civil society of their own that isn't simply a binary militarized version of Russia versus the West. I mean, one of the things that's so striking to me, um, it doesn't mean that everybody on the street is a capitalist. I don't mean that. I mean, uh, much as you do. I mean, you also mean a broader notion of what kinds of values do they want to take part in? What kind of civil society life do they want to um, enrich themselves? What kind of security do they want to keep developing? And it looks to me 
as if, and this is, I'm sure, um, frustrating Putin, um, and that is that they come out in the street because they want a different kind of security than the one imagined in his very shrunken notion of a narrative of Russia versus the West. And I think once again, you have to, you, we, all of us, we have to look at civil society in Russia and not imagine that Putin speaks for all Russians. Cer certainly Putin does capture a kind of nationalistic paranoia that some Russians, um, particularly maybe older Russians, although I wouldn't be ageist in that, um, but that some Russians do imbibe um, a hangover from the Cold War and from their notion of uh, the World War II narrative, which Putin, by the way, is pushing, even before his invasion, was pushing very hard on a particular Putin-esque narrative of World War II to be taught in elementary schools. Um, and in that sense, he's trying to sell a narrative of Russia versus the West, a narrative of nation equals paranoia, a notion that the military and his security forces, because he depends on the police, not just the military, um, he is trying to sell that. But my sense is that the outpouring of opposition to that militarized, shrunken notion of Russia versus the West, that outpouring of opposition that we're seeing on the streets, uh, and of course there are a lot of people who are too afraid to go on the streets who may support the people on the streets holding up the no war signs. My guess is that they don't buy that narrative. That is not their narrative. That is that not their notion of security. So for instance, one of the things I'm trying to do very hard now in all our conversations, even in just you know private conversations amongst friends, I don't say the Russians invaded Ukraine. I don't say Russia invaded Ukraine. I say Putin's regime and his security forces are suppressing demonstrations in Russia and his military forces are invading Ukraine. It takes more breath but I think it's more accurate. The Russians are much more divided in their notion of security, their notion of a lively uh, future um, than Putin would have us believe. So I talk about the Putin-led military in Ukraine, or I talk about the Russian military, or I talk about the Russian, about the Putin regime. I do not, and I think it's really important that we don't do it, that we do not say the Russians invaded Ukraine. Because it's quite clear that a lot of Russians had no idea that Putin was going to launch this invasion, and they're opposed to it because it destroys their notion of a secure future. Yes, I, I, I agree with you here. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we see that the regime is extremely repressive at this point of all these uh, uh, opposing voices and forces. Yes, so, but I think, Liliana, it's, it's oppressive, it's suppressive, because it doesn't control the narrative in people's heads. That's why I think we have to constantly narrow the definition of what this regime is. And, I mean, we have to be accurate that it's a very narrowly based regime now, um, narrower by the day, and its narrative is not a narrative in many Russians' heads. So I don't want to give it legitimacy or credit or strength by imagining that it is a narrative of Russia versus the West. It's Putin's narrative that some Russian nationalists and some Russian militarists um, certainly imbibe, but it is quite clear every day that he is actually having to wield his oppressive security forces to keep a broader narrative of how Russians think about a healthy, vibrant future from actually having um, visibility. I still want to give him power by claiming that he speaks for more people than he does. Thank you, Cynthia. Let me turn now to, to Karen to see what, uh, how, what is her response to this question. Please, Karen. Yes. Thank you. Um, 
I was really struck by a comment that Angela Stent, who is, you know, at Georgetown University and at the Brookings Institution, who is a very long sort of observer of uh, Russia, and she, in response to a question that about the um, sanctions on on the um, on the oligarchs, said, uh, "Well, I mean, they serve at the pleasure of the czar, right? So." We are being taken back into uh, a, you know, a 19th century understanding of what uh, realpolitik is and what his intentions are. But his intentions are really to establish, reestablish a zone of influence, right, and to reshape the Euro-Atlantic security order in favor of of Russia. And I was struck by the constant references to. You know, um, remilit uh, the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine, and I kept asking what that meant. And demilitarization means, right, that he will create a vassal state that has no uh, capacity to for self defense and for to de de determine its own security, right? So de demilitarizing means neutralizing in in a very in a much more broader definition of what that is. Denazification is just simply, I think, right? It means that it's a replacement of the political leadership for a puppet regime or a compliant regime that essentially Russia controls. And again, I was struck by the, the example of Belarus. I think that's a very, very serious concern that has to be brought up here because not only uh, for all the other reasons um, that it really is in some ways a vassal state now. Um, Lukashenko has uh, signed over essentially all of Belarus's infrastructure. I mean, the the sort of uh, friendship agreements that they signed last September on customs, on infrastructure, on um, he, the Russians really control um, almost all parts of the infrastructure and, you know, again, on February 27th, let's not forget with the constitution, you know, for the uh, referendum on a new constitution, um, Lukashenko has has signaled that, in fact, um, he is open to having um, the Russian uh, Russian army deploy and station nuclear weapons on the territory of Belarus. So there is a what changes the strategic calculus is that Russia will be able to use Belarus as a, as a, you know, as a strategic outpost, right, to project power. And that is a great concern because is that the model that he's trying to follow in the Ukraine? Is that kind, that level of a compliant regime? I think it's, I don't want, you know, to, to look at the worst case scenario is a very frightening prospect. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's why it's important to try to find a way for, for the West, for the United States and Europe and OSCE and the UN to try to be able to be part of whatever kind of settlement or outcome that comes out of this. We don't know how it ends. I mean, if there is complete subjugation, then perhaps the West has very little to say about what happens, right? Um, or whether, uh, I, I cannot, imagine uh, the Ukrainians accepting, you know, carving out sort of neutralizing and then carving out parts of of their country to to Russia, to Belarus, who knows, right? That those are questions that have to be uh, that we still have no answers to, but I think it's it's very serious. Um and the thing that that I think most of all worries me and things that is that um in the United States, there are many, many, many articles about sort of this is a new era. We're living in Putin's world, right? Um, we we suddenly this, there's another and a different kind of world order. But to me, it feels like unfinished business, right? It isn't a new era as, era as much as it is a throwback to the kind of security concerns and security demands that Putin has for you know this kind of. Um, reprieve of what the Soviet Union was. And I think we have to counter that narrative because um, we're not in a zero sum world. I don't want to accept a zero sum world that is once again, right, uh, ordered along sort of military security and military zero sum calculations. We have to basically say that this is not the world 
that we can live in, that we have a different way of ordering it and of hopefully finding a way to resolve this so that in the future, um, the, I don't know how, how Russia is going to, I mean, Russia wants a different type of security order, but that's where, again, our, one of the, the reasons why we're here to talk about women, peace and security and the role that gender has to play. I think that the point of this is not to look at this as a world in which military security and hard power again will dominate, but we have to change the narrative towards something that is more broader in our understanding of what security is, of human security, of the needs um, for, you know, and all sorts of sort of non-military aspects, because we've we've lived in that world for for decades. We understand what how broad that definition of security has to be, and that's where our understanding of women, gender, and security, the women, peace, and security agenda comes in, right? Because um, we know how important these sort of di diversity, gender, are important to security issues. You know, we know that. Um, that that kind of diversity matters in all as you know it's the, all these various aspects in in peace agreements um, in uh, for example you know an international peace research institute study in uh, in you know 2019 found that women's inclusion in the peace process led to a 35 percent increase in the likelihood of these peace process agreements lasting longer than 15 years at least 15 years and longer we know that these things matter and there is a there is agency in women participation at all levels of this and so i think again countering that narrative um the, the questions of disinformation the questions of diplomacy we I don't want to live in a world that's defined by Putin. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't live in Putin's imagined world. And I think that's our responsibility moving forward. And that's why, again, having a common unity and a narrative that can be sustained. Part of, part of I think the real dilemma is how long is this, pro, uh, how long is this conflict going to last? There will be costs to the West also in terms of oil, in terms of, you know, prices of food, you know, going up. Domestic political concerns are going to have to be addressed. And when so when those kind of pressures begin, we have to try to understand how we can be flexible, how we can be adaptive and resilient so that in the end we can counter and minimize and hopefully prevent um, Russia obtaining the kind of objectives that it has set itself to. Thank you, uh, Karen. Um, I just wanted to say one thing. I noticed uh, this idea, this liberal view that you project here, saying that uh, you don't believe in a world uh, which is a zero sum game. Uh, you believe that uh, we should uh, we should uh, you believe in a world in which the, there is win and win win uh, there, there are win win solutions, and I just noticed that uh, at least so far China projects the same uh, worldview. I'm just noticing that. Uh, the second thing I wanted and the last thing to say to you is that. Uh, you know, just imagine that uh, Canada, which is your neighbor is attacked maybe i don't know by some power whatever you know uh, and uh, that power starts carving out of of uh, canada and uh, this is how we feel here um so i just wanted to give you this uh, i don't know a picture of how we feel here and we do, don't tap into putin's uh, uh, narrative on the contrary we are going we are trying to fight it but there are all kinds of um, segments of population which think differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe we are going to continue uh, these discussions, maybe in another format, another time. But thank you very much for participating. I'm going to give the floor to my colleague, my co-moderator, Alina. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody. I just want to say uh, that I'm very happy that finally we talked about um, the fact that this is a long term endeavor, it's going to have costs on the Western societies as well. Um, I do hope that the Western societies are being prepared somehow 
um, against what's going to happen, the economic costs, the, the societal unrest, which, which this economic cost might bring. Uh, history teaches us very, uh, very, bad, uh, very bad things about this. Um, and the economic crisis that's going, that's going to come. Um, also, it, when it's about narrative, I think we should have a stronger narrative, not only against Putin, but also pro-democracy and pro-peace, pro-stability. And that's what I haven't, this is my personal concern, but that's what I haven't really heard in the last few days or in the last few weeks, rather than since the, since the war started, it's been Putin is bad, Putin is bad, Putin is bad, which of course Putin is extremely bad. Uh, but I also want to hear the other side of the stories, like we are good, we are good because we can resist, resist, resist this, we are good because we can fight this, and that's what I'd like to hear more, not only in Romania, but really throughout the transatlantic space. Um, well, thank you very much for, for being with us and for being with us till the end. Um, and I hope that we can continue this conversation, as Liliana said, in, in uh, with, with another occasion. Thank you very much, Liliana, for putting this together. So thank you very much, Simona Fubungu, for hosting it and also helping putting this together. Um, and I wish everybody for tomorrow happy Happy Women's Day. Yeah, happy International Women's Day, which is a day for changing the narrative. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very All much. All the best. <laughs>